here at this, uh, at this workshop. Um, I always have a fond place in my heart for Berkeley. So, uh, and just a little bit of, uh, about my own background, I now teach at a law school, uh, but I also, uh, in addition to actually having my law degree from, from here, from, from Berkeley, um, my PhD in computer science is also from here. So I have a kind of mixed background here, and so I love being able to um, talk about these kinds of concepts in this, in this way that blends both the computer science and the law. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how we might think about uh, the ways in which the law does or does not, um, or is or is not capable of really quantifying this notion of privacy or formalizing it in some mathematical or, or computer science uh, sort of way. So we might start by, let's see. Oh wait, I haven't plugged anything in. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we might start by taking the example of HIPAA, the health privacy law here, um, which provides that a covered entity or business associate may not use or disclose protected health information except as permitted or required by the law. And so there's this concept then of using or disclosing protected health information, right? And so that's a legal requirement not to disclose protected health information. Um, and so the question then becomes whether or not that legal requirement is formalizable or not. Now the one thing, the first thing that I want to notice about this is that this legal requirement is expressed, as many legal requirements are, um, in the form of a prohibition, right? It's a prohibition on disclosing protected health information. And so in many instances, what we're really trying to do is to formalize not necessarily privacy as a concept generally, but a privacy violation, right? What we want to know is under what circumstances will this legal requirement be violated? And so what we, what we want to be able to specify is the, the, the set of constraints or the, the sort of mathematical situation uh, that would create a privacy violation, right? That's such that, that a, uh, when this thing occurs, a privacy violation has occurred. That is to say, this particular law has been violated. Now this, of course, then requires um, some exploration of what counts as protected health information, as you just heard in the previous talk. Um, HIPAA is the one then uh, that um, goes on to specify that protected health information is individually identifiable health information, and then it just defines it somewhat circularly as information that identifies the individual or for which there's a reasonable basis to believe the information can be used to identify the individual. HIPAA, of course, goes a bit further by also then creating the safe harbor, this provision that allows you to escape liability by removing these 18 identifiers. Uh, together with this requirement that there be no actual knowledge, the information can be identified. Um, and so if you think about that, what this is basically doing is to create a carve out to uh, what counts as a privacy violation, right? So what counts as a privacy violation is disclosing something, but if you disclose uh, things that don't include these identifiers, then that automatically counts not as a privacy violation under the law. Uh, other laws, however, are, are let's say one side in the other direction. They, they specify things which do count as disclosing personal information without necessarily specifying what counts as not disclosing personal information, right? So the GDPR in particular applies to the processing of personal data, uh, which it then goes on to define as, again, one who can be identified directly or indirectly, but then it further describes a list of various things which are um, uh, defined to, in fact, be personal data. Obvious things, perhaps things like name and, and identification numbers, uh, but perhaps some less obvious things like location data, online identifiers, and the like. And so what this does is to create a positive list of things which will definitively trigger the law without necessarily providing a list of things uh, or a list of ways by which you can definitively fall outside of the law, right, the way that the HIPAA uh, law did. For an example of a similar kind of system within the United States, you can look at the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which again applies to the collection of personal information from a child. Uh, and then personal information is defined with this long list that's uh, perhaps a little bit hard to see because it is so long. Um, again, a list of different kinds of things which are definitively personal information under the statute, uh, but a non-exhaustive list because the fundamental definition itself is that personal information simply means individually identifiable information, uh, including these things, but not, um, not limited uh, to the things in the list, right? So like the European law here, uh, this provides an affirmative list of things which fall within the category without necessarily providing means of falling outside of the category. All right. Um, so then how does one then go about thinking about uh, uh, how, one, how one could formalize uh, 
a notion of which things fall in or outside of this category of identifiable information. Or again, more precisely, fall in or outside of the category of a privacy violation, of disclosing personal information, disclosing personally identifiable information, right? Uh, for a long time, of course, that we had this view, the relatively narrow view that what counts um, is being able to uh, 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 determine uh, the identity of an individual record in the database, right? Which is then what leads to uh, the notion of K-anonymity um, and, and this as the method of, pr of protecting privacy, right? Again, notice this is the method of protecting privacy because the definition of a privacy violation here is that you will uh, be able to determine the name associated with a particular record, right? And so if you take that as the definition of a privacy violation, then in fact, K-anonymity works perfectly well, all right? So the next thing that I'll notice about this is that if you think that's the wrong result, it's not for any kind of true technical reason, right? It's not that you can point to a technical basis for describing to me that K-anonymity doesn't, quote, work, because you first had to determine what, ca what counts as working, and that requires you to make a translation between what the law requires, not disclosing personal information, and what your definition of working is. If you define working to be that you do not disclose information in such a way that you can determine the name associated with a particular record, then K-anonymity does just fine, right? And so what, what the objection then is to K-anonymity is presumably not that that like, doesn't satisfy some formal definition of privacy, but it doesn't satisfy the formal definition of privacy that we want. Right? And so that then requires us to determine, well, which formal de definitions of privacy do we want? Presumably, that is going to be a question of plausibility. What matters is whether or not the definition you, de you decide you want to adopt, the formalization you decide you want to adopt of any kind of legal or policy requirement is, in fact, plausible or not. Right? That's what we're looking for. What we're looking for is a plausible account of what the law requires and then that is the thing that we can use to try to determine whether or not uh, we can actually satisfy that using technical tools. Now, what makes, what makes the underlying definition for canonymity potentially implausible? Well, I don't think I need to go through that uh, with this particular audience, right? But there's at least uh, a couple of different ways um, in which this does not uh, protect against certain kinds of problems that we might plausibly think of as being included within uh, the ambit of, of what should count as a privacy violation. Right? One of which is, of course, sensitive attribute disclosure. So in this two, two anonymous list, um, two of the uh, uh, you know, uh, relevant um, uh, entries here have exactly the same sensitive information associated with them. Um, and so then the result would be that that attribute is disclosed, even though individual, the individual record cannot be identified. Um, and then, of course, we have the Netflix prize example of the problem of side knowledge, or said differently, the problem of trying to determine what counts as the knowledge within the, the scope of what the adversary will, will have access to. Um, and so, of course, canonymity is also quite sensitive to that um, and to whatever kinds of assumptions you might make about the background knowledge um, of your adversary. A different way of thinking about the Netflix problem um, in the way that I've, I've previously written about uh, is this idea that it depends on whether or not the adversary should be modeled as one who's sort of uh, a, a completely unknown third party, or whether or not the relevant adversaries include people with uh, special knowledge that might otherwise um, give them the ability to uh, make attacks that would not be available uh, to, a broader, uh, to a broader set of adversaries. Okay. Um, so then if we don't like the, the underlying notion of privacy that we might get out of, out of canonymity, or the one that canonymity actually satisfies, um, how can we think about whether or not we could develop, again, another, another different kind of account uh, of, of privacy that would be more plausible, but which at the same time is formal, right? So we want something that's both more plausible and formal, something that, that is amenable to uh, some notions of um, of, of technical guarantees, OK? I mean, so try to think about the extent to which we can or cannot do that. I'm going to divert for a moment away from strict questions about privacy and the like to, think, to give you two contrasting examples of where the law um, has been willing to formalize and willing to quantify in particular, um, and another in which mostly the law has not. So first, when we think about uh, a place where the law has been willing to quantify, think about something of like the loss of chance doctrine. So what is this? Let me describe this a little bit. 
So th this is a class of problems in which what happens is a doctor, for example, fails to diagnose a patient. And as a result, the patient develops a disease, and the patient ultimately, in this, you know, in this particular case, for example, dies. So the question is, is the doctor ultimately responsible for the patient's death? The problem is, is that diagnosing a disease is only the first step in actually being able to treat a disease, right? Many times when you successfully diagnose a disease, uh, nevertheless, the treatment is unsuccessful, and the patient may die anyway. And so the loss of chance doctrine was, was meant to deal with this problem. Because see, the, so the theory goes, if that's the case, it could be that you could say that even though the doctor you know, failed to diagnose this disease, and perhaps was indeed quite at fault for failing to do so, let's take that as an assumption, right? The doctor should have figured this out when the doctor did not. Um, the patient may have in some sense suffered no damage as a result, in the sense that the, res the end result may indeed have been the same either way. Because if indeed the patient would have died under either circumstance, right, the treatment would have been unsuccessful, uh, then in fact the doctor's negligence makes no difference. And the patient should not, in that sense, be able to recover damages from the, from the doctor as a result. But what's often the case is it's not that it makes no difference, but that it makes a kind of probabilistic difference. Right? What really ends up happening is that the doctor's failure to diagnose uh, means that the chance of survival of the patient has gone down, right? Um, and so then the question is whether or not the patient can be compensated for that loss of a chance. The loss of the chance to have recovered that the patient otherwise might not have had. The traditional rule was no, you couldn't recover for this loss of a chance. You had to show either probabilistically that the patient was likely to have survived otherwise, and then you could recover, or if you couldn't show that, then you wouldn't recover at all. Uh, but what courts increasingly have, um, have come to is this notion, well, no, we really can quantify that risk or quantify the loss, right? Quantify the additional risk, as it were, that the doctor ended up imposing or the, the, the additional loss that the doctor ended up imposing. Um, and having quantified that risk, we can compensate for it, okay? And so that's one, uh, one way in which the courts have been willing to quantify something, right? Take this somewhat amorphous concept of the responsibility of the doctor in, this, in, this, in, this, in these kinds of circumstances, I mean, to actually quantify them and compensate uh, accordingly. Uh, alternatively, I want to turn uh, for the moment away from what we mostly have been describing of the HIPAA privacy rule and look at the HIPAA security rule. So the uh, privacy, the, the, the law that covers medical privacy also has various requirements with respect to the um, security of such uh, health information, in particular electronic uh, health information. Um, and so it, it requires uh, the, these kinds of covered entities to, among other things, ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the electronic protected health information um, or anything that the business associates and the like, right? Um, but what do, what do you mean by ensure, right? We don't literally mean ensure as, as in the sense of um, uh, like an insurance company, right? We don't mean ensure in the sense of, you know, make absolutely sure that this, will, that this will happen, right? Make absolutely sure that confidentiality, integrity, and availability will be maintained, right? Such a thing is impossible, all right? So what's really required? What's really required um, is that they reasonably and appropriately implement standards and, and specifications in order to satisfy their requirements. So they have to have not perfect security. We know that doesn't exist. That would be a crazy thing to require. Instead, they have to have reasonable security. They have to have reasonable security. Well, so then the question comes to, could we have a formal model for reasonable security? Okay. Now, I'm sure many of you are starting to think down the road of, well, we, you know, we could, right? You can imagine all sorts of formal models for reasonable security. But would they be plausible? Would, be, would they, in fact, be the ones that we want to have, right? Would they be the ones that would correspond to what the you know, people who pass these laws or policymakers or the like, what they meant to do in the law itself? Um, and I think the answer to that is mostly no. Uh, and I think you get that by looking at what, what approach that the lawmakers actually wanted companies to take in, in deciding whether or not um, a given requirements would be reasonable or not. So the, uh, yeah. You, you keep using the word plausible. And, um, 
coming from a perspective of a law ignorant. Yeah. I'm not sure I fully under that dive down into like I fully understand what you mean by plausible definition. Like you say it's a convincing. Law Is convincing better? What? Convincing. Okay, let, let me are you, are you basically telling me the loss is one thing, but the intent behind it was a different thing? No. I just mean, look, um, uh, you know, do you have an account that we can agree upon as a social matter? And so in that sense, I'm, I'm specifically pointing out an, an extremely non-technical question, right? I, I just mean, can we all agree as a matter of just, you know, democratic systems and governance and the rest, that this is in fact the right thing to do. <coughs> That's what I mean by plausible or convincing or something of the sort. All right? And, and so I guess what I'm pointing out, right, is that, is that if you want to distinguish the, the model that underlies canonymity from the model that underlies differential privacy, right, it's got to be on the basis of simply convincing people that one of them is better than the other. And, 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 and I mean convincing people not in the sense of a formal theoretical proof of that fact, but rather in the ways in which we just set law and policy generally. To me, there is a lot of temporal component to it and a lot of you know, brilliance component to it. What was thought to be plausible, I assume, when HIPAA was founded, was turned out to be not so plausible nowadays where we can run a reconstruction of it. Uh, I mean, well, okay. I, I mean, so so yes and no, right? So so what you what but what you're really describing is that is that people may be convinced for reasons that you think are faulty, right? I mean, in other words, convinced based upon faulty assumptions about the future, uh, or, or about this the the state of the you know the the, the state of the technology itself. Not so much faulty, but sort of as you say, if we go about what we agreed upon, these agreed upon issues of law and morality, which again, I'm not that perspective, uh -huh. change and develop due to the development of technology, partially. Uh, well, that's true too. So um, uh, I guess uh, I, I think that's absolutely the case. And so you are absolutely right that this notion of plausibility or convincingness or whatever no. is temporally inde indeterminate. It would have been one thing had you been arguing that a certain law is outdated. Um, but I think you're making a different claim or a strong claim, or maybe you're making the same claim under a different name of plausibility, which again, I'm not sure I follow. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Um, uh, let, let me just let me just proceed further, and then and then when we get to the end, let me let me see if let me see if I can we'll, we'll come back to this concept as well. Um, all right. So uh, in this particular context, in, in this particular context, what I'm describing here is again this notion of what will count as reasonable security. Right? Reasonable security itself is a bit fleshed out in the uh, regulatory rule here, uh, which says that well, when you're determining whether something is reasonable, you need to consider these various factors. There's a bunch of things that we need to take account of to try to determine what would count as a reasonable security or not including the size, complexity, capabilities of the covered entity, uh, their technical infrastructure and the like, uh, the costs of the security measures, the probability and criticality of the potential risks to the information. Now, I want to notice that some of these things are relatively straightforwardly quantifiable, things like costs and indeed something like probability as well, right? Um, even though this is perhaps a harder thing to quantify, it is still nevertheless something that is uh, potentially quite uh, quantifiable. Um, on the other hand, criticality, not so much. Um, because here what we're being asked to do is to determine something about the nature of the risks themselves, right? Um, not so much about their likelihood of occurring um, or even somehow their relationship at some kind of technical level, uh, but our notion about how much we care about the risk, right? If, if this risk were to come to pass, how much should we care about that actually happening? Now even here we could imagine a, a form of this that would basically say, well, look, uh, by criticality, we mean literally the dollars and cents uh, losses that would result uh, if, this, if this risk were to come to pass. But mostly, this, these kinds of concepts have not been interpreted that way generally in the law. I mean, there's been a lot of resistance, both in the security and particularly in the privacy realm, to trying to reduce all such questions to simply a matter of dollars and cents. 
Um, I think that um, however plausible you might think that might be, oh, there, I just used the word again, um, in the security sense, um, I think that it would be quite problematic to then uh, uh, to, to model privacy purely in terms of its economic uh, consequences, right? Um, and so, so if we don't want to do that, uh, what we're left with then is the, is the need to actually evaluate criticality here um, and evaluate in a way that I think is going to be inherently non-technical, uh, in a way that will require us to make some judgments about how much we care about certain kinds of things occurring, uh, even apart from the question of the likelihood of them actually occurring. I mean, I think that's embedded in the way in which this approach is generally described. Um, and I think, uh, and which the, in which many of the laws regarding computer security are actually described. Um, and I think that that's a, let's put it this way, um, an account of what these kinds of security laws would require uh, that would be broadly shared by those who are, who are you know, working on laws of this sort, right? By the law and policy types who, who pass these laws, who I implement these laws, who are enforcing these laws. Okay. Um, and so what, I, what I'm noticing here is this contrast between, on the one hand, the law's willingness to quantify certain kinds of things, but unwillingness to quantify others, right? Um, and the way I would describe this is, a, is, is this notion of quantifying risk on the one hand versus quantifying values on the other, right? We can quantify risk, uh, and we may even be able to count risks of a certain kind, uh, but we, I think, are not going to be willing to quantify values. Um, nor even to try to count them up, let's say, to count up the number of sorts of things in order to be able to establish their, um, their relative social importance. Okay. And so then the question is whether, you know, which category does privacy sort of fall into, right? Um, is privacy the kind of thing that looks more like loss of chance, looks like more like a matter of just sort of computing a quantity that then we can accept as a matter of law? And even if not literally computing a quantity, right, defining a quantity, defining a, a, a pure mathematical concept that will encapsulate our notion of what it is we mean to require by these particular privacy laws, right? Or is it, and I would argue, I think this is the, 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 the answer, more like the security situation. That when we ask for the protection of personal information, we are, in some sense, asking for something that looks a little bit like asking for reasonable security. That we are asking for certain kinds of things to occur in a way that, are, that is sort of conceptually reasonable um, without necessarily that being able to be fully formalized um, into a, a mathematical concept. So, Philip? Yeah. Can one look at this security rule as actually a combination of two rules, the black one and the red one, okay? And the black one seems to be quantifiable, and uh -huh. maybe there we could uh, exactly write what that means in, in with mathematical yeah. language and yeah. so on. And what you're saying is that would be kind of a necessity requirements for, for security, but because there's also the value, the, the red uh, requirement, this is not going to be sufficient, and we'll have to, apart from the technical examination of the security uh, measures, also look at it with a red eye uh, about the, the, hopefully not the tire, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but the, 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 the red part of the, uh, uh, and make a determination separately, and only then the combination of the two determinations will will mean that we actually have a sufficiently secure system. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's right. And I mean, I think, look, if you look at the real world of computer security, right, it would be a weird thing to some, for me to de decide that the real world of computer security involved, involved you know, all non-technical questions, right? There are plenty of technical questions involved in trying to determine the sufficiency of security. Um, but the idea here is that it's not exhausted by that. And so I absolutely, I agree with you that, that, um, that both on the security and the privacy side, uh, that the technical tools have a really important role to play in trying to, um, uh, you know, as you describe it, uh, achieve the, the, the black language, right? Uh, what, but, that, but nevertheless, that doesn't exhaust the, the, the top-level concept of what it is that the law requires. Um, and so the ultimate requirement of the law will require both that portion and the values portion. Yeah. I want to make sure that you're not, or I want to understand, are you saying that the values portion uh, is not informed by technical understanding? Because So what if I reason about data privacy and say, if this is how I understand the values portion, then it allows me to do anonymity? 
Uh, but I understand, as a technical matter, canonymity allows x, y, z attacks. So I should sort of conclude that my my uh, conception of the values was maybe naive. No, but I guess what I mean is so. Okay, so then canonymity allows x, y, z attacks, and then the question. Value I don't want to allow. And then the question is whether or not those x, y, z attacks whether you care about them. Agreed, but but whether the values are sort of captured by uh, some approximation to those values can be a technical question. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So I'm separating the question of whether or not the the you know the identify. Well, let's 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 take a different one. Whether whether attribute disclosure could or could not in fact be protected against through canonymity, right? Cannot, right? That's a purely technical question. Uh, from the question of whether or not, if sensitive attribute disclosure occurs, whether or not I should care about that under this particular law. Yes. Okay. okay? And so those are the two separate questions that I'm, de I'm de de describing. Uh, but you, you, in some sense, need to answer both of those questions in order, to be able to, in order to be able to fully understand the relationship between the legal requirement and the, and the technical tools. Um, so with respect to differential privacy in particular, um, you know, one way to think about the, the concept that underlies differential privacy here you know, through the fundamental definition uh, is this idea that then a privacy violation right, is an example, essentially, of a, a pair of neighboring data sets and a particular um, uh, outcome such that, essentially, you know, the inequality goes in the other direction. right? I mean, that's what you're looking for when you're, when you're, when you're looking for essentially a, a failure of something to be, uh, to be differentially private, right? Um, and so the extent to which one defines that as the underlying concept for what counts as not disclosing personal information, then differential privacy is the answer to that question, right? So you could, you could in that sense, derive a kind of underlying formal concept that corresponds to differential privacy. But what I'm trying to point out here is this, the possibility that, uh, that some s examples of neighboring data sets and outcomes right, are, are more socially significant than others, or at least that's the potential. Right? In other words, when l lawyers and regulators and the like are um, you know, conceptualizing these things in the first place, uh, they are thinking about it in a world in which not every D1, D2, and S are indistinguishable from every other D1, D2, and S. Okay. Uh, and so that's going to then create um, a different perspective on how to think about the sort of the, 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 the you know the underlying concepts here. Um, yeah, um, that uh, will make it difficult, I think, to have a fully formal notion of what the legal requirement ultimately is going to be. Yeah. Um, I want to just try and develop the idea that I think you getting at when you're talking about what's quantifiable and what is this thing that you're calling a value. When, whenever I hear people talk about risk versus utility, I, I kind of I get very prickly. Because what's often not said is that you can reduce it all to one dimension without really acknowledging that the risks are going to be accrued by some, while the utility or the benefits are accrued by others. Mm -hmm. So when you quantify risk, even like in your security mm -hmm. slide, it's like the risk of a data breach or something accrues to the yeah. subject, whereas the benefits are right. accruing. So let me just finish, but when it's a value, yeah. Not one or the other. It's a it's a societal value. Okay. You can't say risk to freedom of speech. You know yeah. that just doesn't. Yeah. Doesn't okay. So. So just to be clear, I, when I'm describing values, I'm, I'm still talking entirely on the privacy side of the equation and not the utility side. And when I'm describing risk, I mean in some sense having already decided the question risk of what. Which is the crucial question that needs to be asked, right? Like, so, so I'm assuming already that I have some idea of what, I'm, what kind of risk I'm measuring. And then when I say value, I mean what's the, what's the problem that would occur if that risk comes to pass, right? 
And, when I, and, and in defining that notion of risk, you can define it lots of ways. It's extremely unlikely that you define it as like risk to freedom of speech or some such thing, right? In other words, I mean the risk that these particular individuals have this particular information about them disclosed or this particular thing happened to them or the like. And so in that sense, it does incorporate a notion of who is, who is ultimately the, the one to whom the harm is, befalls and not simply some abstract notion of harm you know, divorced from some question of, of who it falls on. Uh, so you just want to observe that uh, uh, absence of uh, differential privacy is not a differential, necessarily a differential privacy violation. OK. Because uh, differential privacy assumes that the randomized function k uh, is, is defined, is well defined. But uh, uh, it may exist in someone else's head, in which case you cannot produce a counterexample to differential privacy. It may exist, in, I'm not sure I follow. What, so. so you can, differential privacy is a positive statement. It says that uh, for a randomized function, k satisfies some properties. Yeah. But uh, the violation of differential privacy may happen in multiple different places. Sure, One okay. of them is that this randomized function k may not be defined um, in the sense that it in includes a statistician making certain inferences, for example. But I guess I'm not trying to argue about when you can or cannot construct a, a, a differentially private system, right? I'm trying to say, what would it mean for a, a, a system that has been designed to, to ensure k-anonymity, for example, to not be a differentially private system, right? So in some sense, I, I guess I, I have in mind already some kind of real-world Im implementation of something, right? And the question is whether or not that real-world implementation of something, in fact, violates some law or not, yeah. right? And if this implementation includes a person, then it's much harder to make this argument. I'm still not sure I followed that. Was, it, was there help on this side? I thought I saw it. No? OK. I, yeah. We can take it off. Um, yeah, OK. Um, let me just, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll take a, just a couple more questions in a minute. But let me just note that um, partially when we've been focusing on differential privacy, we've particularly been focusing, I think, on a realm of, of um, uh, risks and values that are particularly salient in the context of uh, data sets that are publicly disclosed, right? And I think that's in part why I actually think that the census example is one example where, um, you know, this seems like a, a primary use case uh, for that, for this sort of system. Uh, because I think in the context in which um, you are, in fact, going to, ha you know, fully disclose this kind of information, um, you end up having a much harder time being able to reason about other sorts of consequences and the like, all right? Uh, but I don't think that same thing is necessarily true if the disclosure is much more limited, nor I think is the same thing necessarily true if the, if the activity in question is not a disclosure at all. Um, and one thing I want to notice is that if you go about redefining every notion of personal information in terms that are in, uh, you know, more related to differential privacy rather than other, kinds, uh, uh, you know, other sorts of notions, uh, that that same definition of personal information is going to apply across the board in all of the different laws, right? Because this law in particular does not distinguish, at least not at this level, between a disclosure to the public and disclosure to a single individual, right? Any kind of disclosure that is not otherwise permitted by the various sorts of exceptions falls under this prohibition. And so there's nothing on the face of just the phrase disclosing protected health information that allows you to distinguish between public and non-public disclosures when, in fact, perhaps we may, in fact, want to have such a distinction when we try to determine the appropriateness of that disclosure or the sense in which that disclosure really is a disclosure of protected health information. Similarly, everything that I said about disclosure applies here equally to use, right? Notice it's use or disclosure. And if you start thinking about what it would even mean to have a system that ensured differential privacy with respect to uses of the data, not just disclosures of the data, I think that it, that too uh, would be much more limiting than we would normally expect such a law to, to be. 
Um, and I think the same thing is true here when we look at the GDPR, which applies not just to the disclosure of personal data, but to any kind of processing of personal data, extremely broadly defined um, under this particular law. Um, and then similarly here with respect to COPPA, which is actually not about really about disclosure at all, but about the, the collection of personal information in the first place. So despite this idea that you know, the same concept of personal information shows up in many different places in the law, I think it's actually used differently in different places in the law. And I think the result then is that we shouldn't necessarily expect that a single definition, let alone a single technical definition, will suffice across the different places in which the concept of personal information appears in the law. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll leave that uh, uh, then with these three principles that uh, um, when we are modeling legal requirements, we are often modeling privacy violations rather than privacy itself. Back to this notion that uh, when we are determining whether or not the model is a good model, it will be a, quest a social question rather than a technical question in determining um, whether or not the model is good. Um, and finally, distinguishing between uh, attempting to model risk and modeling the underlying uh, social values. Uh, with that, I'm happy, um, happy to take any further questions. We have time for questions. Uh, I wanted to continue this discussion <laughs> of risk and values because, um, and I think it, it has to do with that little point about plausibility. So, um, The risk, when we're talking about, I mean, I think I'm, I'm mainly kind of in agreement. Um, this is not a disagreement with you, but I think it's it's almost like apples and oranges. That when you um, when you're trying to model risk, you're model you've identified um, some harm, and then you're trying to ascertain what is the risk of that harm given. Um, certain threats and the values, of the value, not the values. Whereas the value is kind of not quantifiable at all. <laughs> right, I, I, I agree. So I don't, I don't actually think we disagree about this, is, no, no. is my guess. <laughs> it just could be a question of exposition, really. So when people are saying privacy versus, the, or like the, a utility or something, it's almost like they're measuring a value and a quantity which which I I just can't make sense of. And I'm I'm wondering if this is a similar concern that you're having in the work that you're trying to do. Sure. I mean, I think that's right. Um, uh, look, I mean, at, at some level, depends on the extent to which you, when you compare privacy and utility, you think you're doing that entirely quantitatively or not, right? Um, so I, I do think, I mean, but, but even if it's non-quantifiable, there nevertheless is a real trade-off between the two. So I, I, I mean, I think that part of it still definitely needs to be um, explored in all the ways that, that various speakers have, have described. Um, it's just that it's, you won't be able to do it in a purely quantitative format. <coughs> So it, see, it seems to me that both things like differential privacy as well as Cynthia's work and others on fairness and awareness, right, try to say, OK, we can actually create a way to um, uh, look at the probability right, through moving these sorts of dials, but actually outsource the question not of how much we care about the value, but of how much we care about specific kinds of harms to those values. And you're kind of going back and forth, you know, you ended up here modeling privacy violations, and often yes, the law is about saying we want to limit certain kinds of harms, right, to some underlying value, but then you were talking about modeling values. And I, I just wanted to unpack that a little bit, because I, I think that some of the ways in which the formalization, I think, actually helps us disambiguate risk versus harm and then externalize the question of like, well, given the value that may be harmed, how do we want to think about our tolerance, understanding like how much do we want to move this dial that's going to control probability? Yeah, except for the fact that it, it but the problem here is, is this idea that it's treating every everything that doesn't satisfy this definition is indistinguishable from every other thing that doesn't satisfy this definition, well, right? No, I don't 
ask you. I mean, you can implement it in ways that are contextual and specific. I'm just thinking of at some level of abstraction, it's useful. You might be able to do that, but I'm skeptical, and that's what I mean by about the difficulty of quantifying, quantifying values. That in other words, once you start to try to formalize the notion of which forms of, of non-compliance with this inequality, like how they compare to each other or some such thing, I think, I think that becomes difficult to impossible to do. But I don't think it suggests that you should. I mean, it, like the definition of itself doesn't suggest that you should treat all harms to, right, all um, potential uh, loss of privacy in this way the same. Well, I suppose, except for the fact that, that then if our benchmark is going to be compliance with this definition, right, then the effect will be to say that if you fall outside of this definition that 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 will be some kind of violation of the law, right? I mean, so, so, so when that, I mean, I mean it, uh, again, it depends on which direction you think you're going, right? If the direction you're going is to suggest that differential privacy should allow you to satisfy a legal requirement, I think that's absolutely right, right? If the direction you're going is the legal requirement should be specified in such a form that effectively differential privacy is the only known method of satisfying that requirement, that I'm much more skeptical about. Yeah, I don't think anybody. Well, I mean, I've stated a very strong version of it, right? But I guess what I'm I'm noting is the that's the that's the potential flip side of trying to formalize the underlying legal concept, right? Uh, so that's anyway. Look, look, I, if, I, if I could, I'm hoping to get one more thought, but yeah. So maybe I was wondering, do you have an example of something that you would consider a successful? sort of formula, uh, formula, formulation of a, OK, for, if I understand what you, what you just said, you're saying um, it would, it's very perhaps too conservative or too broad brush to require a definition like this. Um, and I, I kind of agree, although I think for different reasons. But uh, I'm curious if you have an, a, like a positive example of something that you think is a well like of the examples you gave, is there one that you felt did a good job of sort of um, formulating a requirement that that could then be interpreted by regulators or courts or whatever means? When you say a thing that would do a good job, I wasn't sure like what's I mean, the thing you mean. So okay, so if you say, let me see if I can try. Sorry, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, it, so if we don't want to put a requirement like this in, say, a statute, yeah. which I agree we don't, what should we put? And do you have uh, example, success, examples that you think are sort of successful at uh, capturing uh, you know, what is needed at, at the level appropriate, say, for statute? Yeah. So my argument is we should stick with what we've got. And that essentially this concept of personal information is, in fact, ambiguous, but the ambiguity is inevitable. That's my claim. I think the distinction here is um, protecting the private, you, you know, fundamental right for private information, which is exactly what the GDPR is doing. I think you're mixing up concepts here. So we're talking, this is about protecting the confidentiality, right? I'm, I'm entering an agreement with these respondents. They've given me their data, and I'm promising to protect their confidentiality. And this is a good example. But GDPR, for example, is a great uh, statute, which is about protect my allowing um, my protection of my private data, uh, which is it's, it's a privacy uh, law. It has nothing to do with protecting confidentiality. So there seems to be a mix mixture. Of I mean, I understand what you're saying, but the problem then is how do I know which data is your data? Because. Well, in the GDPR, for example, the best thing that happened to the GDPR, all of a sudden I'm getting these emails from all these companies saying, do you want me to still continue get, sending you junk mail? Yeah. Or, you know, or uh, if you do, then click on the button, yeah. right? And so that was the best thing that came out of the GDPR. But that's about my fundamental right to not have my private data. <laughs> I know. Market. The it Europeans... It nothing to do with, with the Europe... these Title 13 mm -hmm. or... The Europeans have a totally different notion of this than the Americans, I agree. But the problem is that the problem for both the Europeans and for the relevant point in American law is that you still need to define what's within scope. 
And so you may have an absolute notion that because it's your data, you should have full control over it, a notion we don't have in the United States and they do have in Europe. But then you still have to decide what counts as your data. And the whole point of this analysis is to try to determine you know, what counts as your data. This, is, this is, has to do with the fact that I am in agreement with the Census Bureau to fill out my census form because they provided me with the confidentiality pledge that they won't reveal my individual information. So that seems to me a different concept. Okay. Uh, right. Unfortunately, I think that we. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm. Stop here, but I'm. I'm happy to keep discussing more with anyone who wants to follow up some more. I don't think I satisfy any of the existing questions, so I'll continue <laughs> to satisfy more.